And why don't we, uh, why don't we get started? Here's our agenda. <laughs> I'm going to take a little risk and tell you a little bit about me. You know, try and start with the story like they tell you in all the presentation handout guides. Um, then we'll look at some new codecs that are out there, some you may have heard of a little bit, um, probably don't know a lot about. Those will be our appetizers. And they are, as you'll see, light and fluffy, but not very filling. And then um, we'll get to the main course, uh, which is you know, talking about VP9 and HEVC. So just to, to kind of give you a little perspective of where, where I'm coming from with new codecs and, and new technologies is that I started working in compression uh, in 1992. I was 10, of course. Um, and I worked for a compression company that was founded by a Georgia Tech professor who was a, who was a genius. It was fractal-based compression. And I worked there for about two years, and we did pretty well. We sold uh, the still image technology that was in incorporated into Microsoft Encarta, which was the first uh, CD-ROM-based encyclopedia. And then I got out in, in 93 and started writing about um, video compression. In about 1997 or 1998, I got a call from a company in Dallas who said, you know, some professor has come up to us and, and said he's got this great new technology for compression, and we've looked at it, and we think it's great, and we're about to give him $10 million. Can you come out and test it and see if, if we should invest in this? And by the way, if, if it works out, you know, we're, we're going to be looking for somebody to help market this, so there may be a job for you. So it was a really, really high dollar-per-hour kind of contract. So I flew out to Texas, and it was really... It was really great, and then I was in a, in a big room with the professor, and he was showing his video, and there were senior executives from this really major company um, sitting in the room, and, and the check for $10 million was prepared but not signed. And we watched the demo, and then I said, can I see the file on the hard drive? You know, because I wanted to see what the size of the video file was. And the professor was like, well, no, not really. We can't, we can't really, you know, isolate that file. And it's like, well, sure you can. I mean, there's got to be. Just show me what the source file is that you're playing. And it turned out the source file was like 10 times larger than what he said the compression was. And, you know, he kind of hemmed and hawed and said, yeah, you know, this is a simulation, but we're sure we'll be able to prove this out in, in, um, in uh, you know, when we finally get the technology done. The bottom line was, he didn't get the $10 million. I didn't get the job. And um, I'm very, very skeptical when I hear claims about new compression technologies. I, I do really believe that there are great strides that can be made. But until I see it, I mean, I don't think I'm God's gift to codec testing. But we got a call from a codec vendor a couple of weeks ago. And he said, you know, we've got this H.264 technology that's better than anything you've ever seen. You know, it, it's really groundbreaking, all the adjectives that you would expect. And, what I did was I said, OK, well, let me use your cloud service to test it. So I uploaded a file, and then I created a file with Sorensen Squeeze using x.264, you know, something we've all done dozens of times. And the file quality was pretty much the same. So it's like, well, <laughs> you know, show me what you based your, your claims of, of, of groundbreaking on, and then I can make a determination. So that's, you know, that's kind of my ob objectivity. I mean, I've been on the marketing side. I've written the marketing copy for Kodak companies before. Um, so I, I kind of know what goes into that, but I also know that until you actually see the results, you can't, you know, you shouldn't get too excited. But there are some new things coming. We'll cover what those are, and then we'll look at, um, <laughs> we'll look at VP9 and HEVC. Anybody here of DALA? Anybody here of Ogtheora? So Ogtheora was the original um, HTML5-based codec, which, in my view, was mercifully Put to, put to its uh, permanent sleep when, when, uh, when Google open sourced uh, VP8. Because it really, it wasn't that bad a codec, but it really wasn't anywhere close to being marketable and, and, and productized. It really was just, it wasn't there. Um, so Dala is from the same people who brought us Og Theora, but they also brought us the Opus audio codec, which is, a, I've never, anybody using Opus in any way? That's kind of, every time they mention DALA, they mention Opus as this big grand success that, you know, hey, we did this with Opus, we can do this with DALA. And I've just not met a lot of people who've used Opus, so I can't really judge that. But it is Mozilla, they've obviously done some good things, and it is ziff.org. And the goal of DALA is to provide a, a video format that's free to implement, use, and distribute. So basically, they're trying to get around the licensing implications of uh, X.265, H.265, and you know, VP10 or VP9 is, is going to be 
royalty free, we think, we'll, we'll cover that in a few minutes, but the next technology introduced by Google after VP9 may be patent encumbered as well. So they did a deal with MPEG LA for VP8 and VP9, but we don't know what's going to happen with VP10. So the goal of DALA is, you know, we want to produce something that is not IP encumbered. So not a lot of information out, there's nothing you can test at this point. These slides are from the free and open source developers European meeting that kind of shows uh, what their goals are, and then the URL for this is, is obviously on the page below that. So this is, you know, free and open source uh, developers European meeting, and here's some of the progress made by DALA. Again, this is kind of the simulation stuff that they do. There's no files that you can test. There's no codec that you can test, but they're showing pretty impressive development, and they're showing, I think, that they're getting pretty close to H.265. And this is kind of interesting. I mean, they're, they're, you know, this is where they say, you know, we're, <laughs> the things we're working on appear to work, but there's a lot more to be done. Um, of course, all of us are distracted by trying to make HEBC and, and VP9 work, and um, we did it with Opus so we can do it with, with DALA. And this is from the, you know, this is pretty significant. This is from the IETF, and this is, you know, a working group that's created to come up with the next generation video codec. And again, the video codec here for them is, is uh, you know, real-time communications competitive to existing codecs. And IPR is intellectual property, so basically, you know, no IPR, you can, you can use it free and open source. And here's their goals, you know, better than state-of-the-art, so better than HEBC, and a defensible IPR. So they're, basically what they're trying to do is they're trying to build a codec with totally new technology. They're saying, you know, we're going to ignore every advance that's licensable in the past, and we're going to go out and we're going to tr try and create it. And they've identified four areas they think they can, um, they can produce the necessary compression, and, um, but not step on anybody's intellectual property rights. So this is, this is where their targets are, and this is the summary from their, you know, from their comment. Uh, you know, from the uh, IETF meeting, it's making good progress. We'd like to contribute it as a potential candidate for the net video codec. Again, a standardized codec that's, that's free and open source. So, you know, the benefits of DAL is it's an open standard. Um, it's supported by the, the uh, Internet Engineering Task Force. It's got experienced codec developers. They've already got a cool T-shirt. Um, <laughs> which says, another day, another dollar. I know it's tough to read up here, but you, know, you can download, the, you can download the, the handout and see that. You know, the negative, from my perspective, is they can't benefit from anything that's been done before them. So they really, basically, if it's something that people have, have, um, have patented or, or otherwise protected, they can't use it. So basically, they're, they're starting from a whiteboard, and that's, that's pretty tough. I mean, a lot of this ground has been very, very effectively plowed over the last few years. And, you know, whether they, can, whether they can meet this accomplishment, it's really tough to tell. You know, my guess, you know, I wouldn't, uh, odds of being relevant within two years, you know, I, I think it's pretty small. So this is not one that would keep me awake at night if I was choosing a, a UHD technology to deploy. So RMV, this was a, you know, kind of a backstory. I mean, we were sitting there in, in January of 2015, and we were thinking, nothing's new coming from the codec world. You know, we have HEBC, we have VP9, we won't see anything else. And then within three or four months, we saw three or four major press releases that came out and said, hey, we've got this new thing. We just saw this dollar one. This is uh, Real Networks introduced a press release before CES 2015. Um, and, you know, any new codec is going to get a lot of... Um, a lot of attention, and you know. So w what really is there? You know, and it's it's the claims in the press releases. It's, it's a new high definition codec, revolutionary product, um, and it was interesting that it was pointed at HD, not UHD, because you know we kind of pointed it at HD three or four years ago, um, and I think it turns out that this is a product that's successful in in China but it's not been particularly successful anywhere else. So they were trying to build on this. Um, they dropped support for their Helix product line in late 2014. That's their server-based product line. And then if you do a search for the codec on their website today, there's no results found. So I don't know if anybody saw this announcement from, from Real Networks. It was one I needed to track down, and it just doesn't seem like there's, there's any uh, 
fire behind the smoke. And this is, this is the most significant one that I've seen. Has anybody heard of Perseus? Anybody saw this? So this was, um, this was one that came out. It was pretty funny because it came out on April Fool's Day. So there was a bunch of, um, a bunch of emails sent back and forth with you know, some of my codec buddies that talked about um, this might have been a joke. Um, one of the funniest articles written about it said they weren't disclosing the identity of their chief scientist because they wanted to keep that a secret for some reason I couldn't understand. But um, the company itself was founded in 2011, and the codec is based on principles underlying human vision, and that's all we know. So that's what you get from the press releases, that's what you get from the facts, that's what you get from any of the articles written about it. And they're claiming um, three times better compression than HEVC or VP9, and modestly stating that they make the impossible possible and the possible more profitable. Um, and then you guys can, can read the rest of the stuff. That's always kind of fun to, to look at. And more specifically, they were, they were reviewed, or not reviewed, they were uh, interviewed by BBC, and the BBC article said, and, and you can see the, the URL at the bottom, you know, Netflix is currently talking about uh, 25 megabits per second for 4K, which translates to, to 12 to 16 megabytes of, of bandwidth actually required. And VNova is saying it can deliver the same picture quality at between 7 and 8. So the bottom line of their claim is, you know, same picture quality as HEVC slash VP9 at half the data rate. And we absolutely, you know, we've, we've uh, requested review copies. We, we requested, you know, can you code this file for us and let us look at the results? And they haven't. Um, they, we started talking to them when they first came out, and then they stopped talking to us. So most impressively about Perseus is they've got, a, they've got some companies who are working with them. Now, you know, I'm pretty skeptical about industry announcements like this. Everybody wants to get their name on a press release. But um, Sky Italia is actually saying that they're using the technology. So they're saying we're deploying the technology today. And then Hitachi um, came out for NAB and said, we've got an end-to-end -end deployment ready UHD ecosystem ready to, ready to roll out. So anybody here test that? I was guessing not. Um, so, you know. The pros for Perseus, they've got the steely-eyed, clear-thinking management team. Love those pictures. Um, and and they, appear to be, they appear to be very well-funded, and they appear to be pretty marketing savvy. These are not, this is not a professor in a back room. This is you know, guys who've done it before with some pretty, pretty impressive credentials. Um, they've got some pretty good partners. You know, again, some of those partners, it's hard to really judge how real the relationships are. But if Sky Italia is saying they're using it, then you have to you have to think they're using it somewhere. You know, it could be backhaul, it could be somewhere in the back room, but they're, you know, it, it, it's not an idea that they've, they've agreed to, to kind of help market. And then the negatives are, we just don't know enough about the technology to say that it's real. I heard, has anybody tried to look at Perseus? We, we heard at dinner the other night that they were now charging. <laughs> if you wanted a demo, they would charge you X. And I, th and I don't know how credible this is, but that's kind of what I heard from another guy in, 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 in the, in the uh, streaming media group. So I don't know if that's, if that's really where they are. But I mean, a lot of these companies, they kind of get there. I mean, they, they're, they're selling the secret sauce. And you know, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be shocked if that's the way it really was. Again, we asked them for samples or the ability to review back when it first came out. They said, you know, we'll consider it, blah, blah, blah. I sent them a couple emails before this event, trying to get some competitive samples. They wouldn't provide anything. They, in fact, didn't respond to my emails. So it's, it's really hard to judge um, how relevant they're going to be in two years. But you know, the bottom line is you know, these guys are McKinsey X consultants. You know, they've done some things. They've produced some products. They've, they've built some companies. So you don't think it's all smoke. So this one, this one is one I would want to watch, but again, until they until they provide the ability to, to test it, it's hard to get excited about it. So that's our, that's our appetizers. Like I said, it's pretty light and fluffy. Um, and I wanted to spend some time looking at VP9 versus HEVC. Um, anybody using VP9? Anybody? Anybody using HEVC? Using <laughs> what are you using HEVC for? 
Anybody actually using HEBC? And I'm not, I'm not trying to be dismissive, but it, it you know, so VP9, the, the high level value proposition of VP9 is it's free. And anybody see the, the, the announcement from Google that said they've streamed 25 billion hours of VP9? So they streamed 25 billion hours of, of VP9 in the, in the 12 months ended April 2015. And I looked at the files they were producing, and they were generally 35% smaller than files encoded with H.264. So, you know, there's stories about whether YouTube pays for bandwidth or not. I don't know. I can't say with 100% certainty that's true. But if you're cutting, you know, if you are paying for bandwidth in your YouTube and you're sending 25 billion hours of video out and you're cutting 35% of your bandwidth costs, that's a lot of money. So, but I think, I think the market, it's, it's not the market's rejecting VP9. I think the market hasn't embraced UHD yet. And I think the other point about VP9 is it's an HTML5 based technology. And that makes it very difficult to use if you care about things like, say, DRM or, you know. So it's, I, think, I think the whole market structure for UHD codecs is not yet mature. Um, I think VP9 presents a pretty attractive value proposition, particularly given the places it plays where HEVC, HEVC doesn't play. But again, we're so new into this UHD codec world that it's not surprising that very few people are using it. So here's the, you know, here's kind of the discussion points. How do you compare a codec? These are the five points I decided to look at. Um, cost royalty structure, HEVC, the MPEG royalty was set. And then again, <laughs> very close to April 1st, um, HEVC Advance came out. Anybody see that announcement? So it was a second royalty group came out. And the, it wasn't shocking that a second royalty group came out because there was a lot of companies represented in the H.264 patent group who weren't in the MPEG LA HEVC group. So you kind of knew they were out there floating around. Um, you know, it's never good. <laughs> it's never good when you see you may have to pay more for, your, for, for the technology. But I think anybody who was seriously considering HEVC had to know that this was coming. Um, but it does create uncertainty regarding the royalty costs. I mean, MPEG LA, you know, the terms were 20, 20 cents per encoder, decoder, $25 million cap, no royalties for uh, encoded video ever. So, you know, H.264, if you're subscription or pay-per-view, you can end up owing a royalty to uh, MPEG LA. None of that was going to be in place with uh, the MPEG LA HEVC royalty. So the big thing about HEVC Advance, I don't think they can really charge a whole lot more than what MPEG LA is charging. If you look at the FRAND, um, free and open source licensing patent models, they really can't you know, they can't go much beyond the 20 cents um, because that's already been established as the fair and reasonable pricing. Um, but they can charge for content, or they can try and charge for content. So if I'm a major publisher and I'm looking at implementing HEBC to save money, all of a sudden I don't know how much it's going to cost me to encode those streams. Whereas with MPEG LA, you kind of knew it wasn't going to cost you anything from a, a content royalty perspective. And now HEBC Advance, we don't know what they're going to try and charge. They said that they'll have the uh, policies in place by Q2 and then the actual royalty agreements you can sign by Q3, but I think it puts a little bit of uncertainty in the market that wasn't there before they came out. Um, VP9, again, I, I kind of alluded to this at the beginning. VP9 signed a cross-licensing agreement with, um, with MPEG-LA for VP8 and VP9, basically said, hey, we can use the technology in H.264 and HEVC for these two codecs, VP8 and VP9, and you can't sue us. And I don't know if money changed hands or I don't know what the, what the basis of the deal was, but the bottom line was nobody was going to sue Google for VP8 and VP9, except for Nokia, who didn't sign that agreement. And now we have this whole new group of IP owners who may decide, hey, we don't like the MPEG LA deal. We didn't sign it, so we're going to go after Google. So I think not only does HEVC Advance put a little bit of uncertainty on the HEVC royalty structure, I think it also adds some uncertainty what's going to happen to VP9. I don't, you know, and then it's, it's just an additional risk that we, there may be royalties on, on, on VP9 or there may be, you know, license issues you didn't expect, to, you know, before HEVC Advance came out. And then the whole quality thing, I mean, quick poll, how many people think the ultimate quality a VP9 versus HEVC will be the determining factor for which codec succeeds. Okay, so it's, you know, we'd like to measure what's measurable, 
but whether or not that's particularly relevant is a totally different situation. I mean, VP8 was a great codec, but it had absolutely no chance against H.264 because H.264 was far ahead in implementation. It played everywhere. But so, you know, you focus a lot on, on VP9 versus HEBC, but at the end of the day, if they're close, I don't think it's going to be a determining factor. And really, you know, cut to the chase, they're close. You know, um, the tests that I did, both for a presentation I gave last year at Streaming Media West, an article that appeared, it's currently on, on, uh, on Streaming Media website, is I looked at three separate files. I used a Cintel animation because I wanted to test animated footage. I used the Tears of Steel movie because I wanted to test, you know, movie type content. And then I created a, a test clip from 4K Source I shot last summer that was a mixed clip with talking head, high motion, high detail, just a bunch of different scenes. And then I tested at three resolutions and data rates, 720p, 1080p, and 4K. Um, significantly, the files were encoded to my specs by Google and MultimediaWare, uh, who, who are controlling the X.265 um, uh, codec. So they encoded for me. And, and the reason I asked them to encode for me was because they know their codecs better than I do. And a lot of the previous studies had created their own encoding parameters, which, you know, if you don't know VP9, it's very easy, you would think, not to, not to get an optimal encode. So Google prepared the command line files for me. I verified the, the encodes. I verified the timings. And, you know, and then I ran the tests. I originally ran them in, um, in, de in December, and then I got an X.265 update on Friday, Friday a few days ago. So I, I ran some tests. There are some caveats that relate to those, but it, it, it is a new version of the X.265 codec. And then I measured primarily, objectively, with the Moscow University Video Quality Measurement Tool. Everybody, who's here has heard of SSIM? Oh, SSIM, PSNR are, you know, objective quality metrics. The one I like best from the, the University of Moscow Video Quality Measurement Tool is, is a measure called the VQM. And the thing to know about VQM is lower scores are better. So SSIM, PSNR, higher scores are better. VQM, lower scores are better. So we're going to look at what the scores are, are like in a second. And then there's a, there's a researcher in the Europe who I think I'm going to be working with to add subjective evaluations to the, to the codecs that I, to the clips that I encoded. So I looked at the objective. I did some quick quality um, subjective tests, but we're going to run some blind tests in front of just normal people to see what they think from a quality perspective. You know, objective tests are nice, subjective tests are a nice addition to those. And then, you know, I just wanted to include these so you knew what I was testing. And, you know, this, if, if you weren't here when we got here, this is, this is available for download on my website at streaminglearningcenter.com. Basically, again, 720p, 1080p, 4K for the three test files at, at, at data rates I thought were going to, you know, be relevant. Some test caveats, um, you know, I got the updated code from, from, uh, from X.265 on Friday. The files that I produce for X.265 are between 5 and 8% too small. You know, I try and get between 5%, you know, if I target, you know, uh, 1.3 megabits per second, I want to make sure I'm within 5% of that. These files were a little bit lower than that, so I think the, the ultimate scores will be a little bit better. Um, I'm going to update my tests this coming weekend, and you can get, you can get the, the final PDF on either streaming media or my website, streaminglearningcenter.com. And Google claimed some improvements but didn't supply a new EXE. So Google said, yeah, we made some improvements, but we can't get you an EXE in time for your own testing. So last December, um, again, this is the VQM metric for, for the three files I created for each clip, and green is good. You know, green is the winner, and as you can see, um, VP9 won, I guess, uh, I guess they, they won four each. Who won this one? I guess they won, VP9 won five. They had an average score of 0 .670, which is, you know, pretty much identical to 0 .671. So the Objective testing that I did showed very little qualitative difference between VP9 and HEBC, and a lot of people were upset. Um, and then with the updated results, the, the new codec, um, we're seeing X.265 about 6% better 
than VP9. So again, I reran the test, um, did not rerun the test for VP9 because I didn't have a new updated codec, um, and, and X.265 pulled ahead. Some caveats, again, the data rate of X.265 is a bit low, so I would expect those scores to get a little bit better. But the, the X.265 guys submitted a new command spring. So they went from, you know, hey, we want to try something different. I need to go back and look at the VP9 encodes and make sure that they're not claiming. You know, we, with the original command strings, we tried to make them a, as equivalent as possible to make sure there was no, you know, no advantage either way. I haven't done that with this yet. So I wouldn't be shocked if, you know, we ended up close to the same place. I think the quality of the two codecs is very similar. And as we, we all agreed a few minutes ago, I don't think that's going to be the determining factor of which codec succeeds anyway. But I think, you know, if, if, if VP9 was half the quality, you know, marginally better than H.264, that would be significant. As long as they're close, I think it's not a, not a major determining factor. Encoding time is kind of a big deal. Um, I found VP9 a lot more efficient from an encoding perspective than X.265. I think it's going to cost you roughly twice as much to encode X.265 as it would VP9. You know, assuming that you're you're limited in your resources, you're, you're encoding at 100%, so you don't have any spare capacity. It's going to cost you, you're going to have to buy twice the computer power to encode to HEVC as you will for, for VP9. So again, not a determining factor, but uh, potentially significant. Encode availability, how easy is it to encode? Um, you know, I think HEVC is much more accessible. Pretty much every, you know, every vendor in the back in the, uh, in the uh, trade show hall will have HEVC encoding. Very few of the um, commercial tools, the high-end uh, enterprise tools, have VP9 encoding at this point. I think Google has done a particularly um, poor job of, of marketing VP9 encoding to a lot of the major vendors. And... You know, it almost feels like their personal codec. Hey, we bought onto because we needed a codec so we could distribute 25 billion hours of video. And that's kind of how they treat it. So when I asked for an updated codec, apparently the one Windows workstation in their Unix-driven labs was broken, so they couldn't get me an updated. You know, it's like, let me buy one for you guys, okay? And then we'll, um, you know, it's Google. So you would think they'd have more than one, one system to work at. Um, but it could be a little bit of a chicken and egg, right? I mean, I, I think there's very little publisher interest, publisher meaning video distributor interest in, in VP9 today. So maybe Google's saying, why should we work hard to make it accessible? But I think people won't be interested in it until it is accessible. On the other hand, if you're Facebook or, or Yahoo, you know, you can figure out the command string to encode VP9. You know, so I think it's not the really big publishers are going to be uh, shied away from because it's hard to access, but a lot of the mid tiers might say, hey, this stuff is too hard to encode. I'm going to try uh, HEVC instead. And playback ability, I think this is a major, this is, this is probably the key area from my perspective. I think for whatever reason, you know, OTT, 4K, smart TVs, I think, you know, HEVC is going to dominate that market. I just, you know, HEVC decode is, is going into pretty much every, obviously every 4K TV. VP9 is in some, but not in all. VP9 is supported in a lot of high-end uh, set-top boxes, but HEVC is in all set-top boxes, all the, pretty much all the new ones. So I think for, you know, if you're looking at this in, in, in different markets, I think OTT 4K broadcast is going to go HEVC. That's always been a market dominated by standards. Um, mobile, you know, bottom line from my perspective is HEVC I think will dominate the market as well, but it's, 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 it's coming very slowly. So you've got... Um, you know, Apple put HEVC encode decode for FaceTime on the iPhone 6 and didn't tell anybody about it. So they're already paying the royalty for HEVC on the iPhone 6, but they didn't make HEVC playback available on that platform, which is kind of crazy. Um, why wouldn't they make it available? Why wouldn't they? So I don't, I don't know. So if it's not there, you can't use it. Um, they could unlock it very easily, but they haven't. Um, VP9 support is not imminent. Um, I think hell will freeze over before Apple supports anything with a, any codec with a VP in the name. Um, you know, they're, they're on the HEVC patent group. They were in the H.264 patent group. I think Steve Jobs' last words were, don't, 
don't license VP9. I mean, he was adamantly against VP8, so I, I just don't see this ever happening. Um, Android version 5.0 plays back um, HEVC and software. It's the Idiom software decoder. Nice plug for them. That's a nice design win for them. Um, that's currently around 10% market share. So, you know, that's only going to grow over the, next, uh, over the next few months. VP9 has played back since Android 4.4 Plus, which is now around 50% market share for Android. But I, I don't think anybody's using it. I don't think, I don't think a lot of people are sending uh, VP9 encoded streams to Android. And again, as I said, I've got a real strong sense that HEVC will dominate this market when it happens. I, I just think mobile's, mobile's hardware, hardware is going to be dominated by standard-based technologies, and that's going to be HEVC. You know, the, what, what Android did with um, HEVC playback, not only did they put in software decoder, they included hooks to HEVC hardware, so developers could access hardware in the system on a chip or in the graphics chip to, to get HEVC playback. Obvious, and there's some talk that Apple kind of did the same with HEVC. There's ties to the hardware in the, in the, um, in the iPhone. So I think it's going to be primarily a hardware-based market, and I think it's going to go uh, HEVC. And then here's where, you know, here's where Google got their 25 billion hours. So if you look at, you know, this is the browser desktop market share today. This is from uh, W3 Counter. Stats kind of vary. Um, some people have Chrome as high as you know, 40, 50, 60 percent. Some people have them as low as 20 percent. But I, you know, my best estimate, and you guys can check your own, your own viewing logs, is that VP9, you know, Chrome and Firefox are going to be somewhere close to 60 percent, which means 60 percent of viewers can currently play VP9. And as, as the market stands right now, 0 percent of viewers can play HEVC. So you know, why didn't you know, why didn't Google use HEVC? Because it doesn't play anywhere. I mean, obviously they could put it in, in, in Chrome if they wanted to, but, you know, VP9 plays in 60% of the browsers today. It, HEVC plays nowhere. And that's, so, you know, when you think about somebody like Facebook or somebody like Yahoo or somebody like um, any of the other UGC sites who don't need uh, DRM, we think about them implementing a UHD technology why wouldn't they use um, VP9? You know, why would they use HEVC? Let's put it that way. It doesn't play anywhere. So, you know, again, talked a little bit about some of this stuff. You know, um, why hasn't anybody else followed suit? Um, I think it's coming from Facebook and Yahoo. And again, if you're CBS or NBC, you can't use HTML5 playback, which is how you access VP9, until the encrypted media extension, media source extensions, all that stuff sorts out so that HTML5 is actually usable. So I think if you're, if you're distributing premium content, you can't use HTML5 playback, which means you can't access it within the, the browsers that we talked about. You can only access it via HTML5-based playback. So I think they're sticking with Flash or Primetime or some solution like that because they need to protect their content in a reasonable way. So I, I think it's, it's a pretty small subset of potentially very large customers who could be using VP9. And I would be surprised if they didn't start using it pretty soon, but who knows. Um, browser market share looking ahead. Microsoft has announced they will include HEVC in Windows 10. I, I, I blogged. It's kind of a, a jerky thing to do, but I, I saw it as a significant negative for HEVC, given the uptake of Windows 8.0. One, and then I got in a big debate with <laughs> some guy who thinks Windows 10 is going to be the, the greatest thing since sliced bread. So, I mean, right now, I think it's three years after its shipment, Windows 8.1 is like 10% of, uh, of all Windows installations. So, let's hope Windows 10 is better. Um, it gets adopted in MOS, and, you know, in, in two years, it's 50% of the market. But if, it, if it's as slow as Windows 8, Windows 10 is going to have very little impact on the HEBC market for a, for a long, long time. I would expect Google to, you know, I've been saying this for two years now, so <laughs> I don't know how imminent this is either. But, you know, Google is Google's going to be close to the maximum royalty for HEBC sometime soon just because what they're doing with Android. And 
You know, so you would assume they would put it in Chrome or Chromecast sometime soon. Of course, $25 million is not going to swing a Google decision one way or the other. But if you're already paying the maximum royalty, you would think you would be close to that. And same thing with Apple. I mean, they're going to be close to the maximum royalty based on the HEBC decoders and encoders in the iPhone 6. Why not include it? Why not include playback on the iPhone? And why not include it um, in Safari and OS 10? Because it's, it's basically free. You've already paid the royalty. Um, and then I don't, you know, I don't think it's ever going to appear in Firefox and Opera. Firefox has found a way to, you know, Firefox and Opera never licensed H.264. They found a way to leverage H.264 support in the operating system. Whether they'll be able to do that for HEBC kind of remains to be seen because it's not in any operating system today. But um, I don't think we're ever going to see it natively in Firefox and Opera. If they don't get it from somewhere else, these companies can't afford the $25 million to, to license it directly. <laughs> and as, you know, kind of summarizing as to the new people, you know, Perseus is the, on, the only one that, that looks like it may be possible, may be relevant in the short term. <laughs> Dollar is, you know, a day late and a dollar short. Um, Real networks just, you know, it seemed like somebody said, hey, let's put a press release and do nothing, and I think that's kind of what happened. Um, and as between HEBC and VP9, I don't think quality will determine the success of either Kodak. Um, I would expect Facebook, UT Facebook, Yahoo, or somebody like that to use uh, VP9 in the next 6 to 12 months via HTML5. But, you know, I expect HEBC to start appearing in browsers and operating systems in the next 6 to 12 months as well. And if, if, you know, if VP9 doesn't start to take off, it's going gonna, it's gonna to kind of disappear. It'll be a nice technology for YouTube, but it'll never be widely disseminated, never be widely used, like VP8. You know, I wrote an article on a streaming media website now that basically said, if you look at the bandwidth savings VP9 has generated, the acquisition price of Onto of $124 million starts to make a lot more sense. It, it really could be their personal codec. You know, like, hey, we needed a codec because we needed to shave costs from, um, from YouTube. And, you know, they're shaving a lot of bandwidth costs and they're saving a lot of uh, uh, encoding costs as compared to HEBC because VP9 is, is twice as efficient. So it really does make sense for, to look at the, the onto purchases. Hey, we need a codec that we can control for YouTube and that's it. So it, it's probably a successful buy for Google, even if it never gets disseminated much beyond, um, much beyond YouTube. Any questions? This will probably get tweeted as, there are members in the audience who have no idea about streaming and ultra high definition, but um, on the desktop, unless you have a really big display, why why would we begin to care if, if you're looking at 4K resolution, but it's only inches from your screen? Is it the it, biggest important part that TV in the living room where you can actually appreciate that resolution? It's, it's the next big thing. Um, I'm with you. I'm, I'm teasing. I'm sorry. The, um, it's kind of a different discussion. I think it's, it's very, very relevant, but I think it's, it's kind of a different discussion. I think it appears that 4K is much more significant in the OTT space than it is in the general streaming space. And you have to temper that important by realizing that there's only 6 million 4K TVs out there and not all of them play HEBC and not all of them will be compatible in, in a year or two. So I think, I think that, you know, what's pushing, probably what's pushing 4K more than anything is just TV vendors needing to sell TVs. That said, we're starting to see a lot of higher resolution displays both on tablets and on computers. And in a lot of ways, because you're so much closer, you, you get the benefit of the extra resolution where you wouldn't with smart TVs because a 50-inch TV from 10 feet, you really can't tell the difference between 1080p and, and 4K. So I think, you know, some of the high-resolution tablets, some of the high-resolution displays are going to be a lot of the early consumers of, um, of UHD content. And 
Did anybody have any statistics about how much of the YouTube downloads are actually 4K? I haven't seen any. But um, they've been doing 4K for a while, and, and that would be a nice statistic to track down. If a lot of people are viewing that, then you know it's, it's relevant. If not, then you know, it, it's more marketing. Uh, as a comment to that, there is also another resolution that seems to be low, which is what HD, not UHD, on the mobile devices. So it's something that doesn't exist in any codec at all. What's because the? Because you look at 4K or UHD and full HD, but there is quad HD. Quad it's HD? Four, yeah, it's four times uh, HD, four times 720p. Oh, four times 720. So that would be. That is, seems to develop right now in all the phones, in Samsung and Apple. They all go after uh, in, in uh, LG, all the big smartphones, they are going for that. But I want to add on to that, uh, one of the discussions from the display makers <coughs> is in the HDR area. You want to expand the color gamut, you want to uh, go in that direction. How does these codecs work in that field? Um, great question. Um, so HEVC, you know, the current implementations of, of HEVC don't handle it today. I mean, you'd have to, in order to incorporate <coughs> HDR um, into the encode display value chain, you need a new codec, you need new displays. And I think VP9 is, it, somebody asked the question on the website, stream media website, I think VP9 is up to 12 bits. So I think it's possible VP9 could handle it as well. Um, but I think, and that's one of the arguments against 4K TV. I mean, I think every 4K TV that's bought to date is potentially obsolete once HDR comes in, and HDR is going to come in in the next 6 to 12 months. So I think you, you, the whole 4K market is based upon a, 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 a current group of um, <laughs> TVs that are going to be rapidly obsolete. And that is, that is different from TV history how? <laughs> well, but, you know, it, it's, I mean, no, very few people bid into the whole 3D TV, I think. Well, and think about HD, 1080i, they were obsolete, basically, within a few, two years, three years. Yeah, I, I didn't buy, I didn't buy those. And I didn't, who has a 4K TV? So I think it's, uh, I think it's a pretty small percentage. And, yeah. and the more, you know, I'm speaking on this uh, later today. And I have some statistics about, you know, what the installed bases are. And there's a lot of articles out there from pretty, like Huffington Post, you know, you're an idiot if you buy a 4K TV today. And, you know, I would never put it quite so forcefully, but it, it's, it's really pretty accurate. Oh, you wrote that? Okay. It's, um, <laughs> sorry, go ahead. Oh, did you have a question? Yeah, I wanted to ask whether or not the Chinese are getting involved. They have the ABS, which there was their competitor H.264. Do we know if they're working on an H.65, which may be competitive to what real networks is doing? Not that I've heard. Okay. Oh, and a clarification. You mentioned that the royalty rate would be coming in Q3. Was that for HEVC Advanced? Correct. Okay. So that we have, we know what the royalty is for MPEG LA. You can download it from the MPEG LA website. But um, the HEVC Advanced, they said, uh, you know, uh, announced by Q2 and, and, and start doing agreements by Q, by Q3. Oh, it's curious about your VQI measurements on VP9 and HEVC. Say it again. I was curious about your VQM measurements right. on, on HEVC and VP9. Were those file level measurements, so the average over the entire file? Those were the average over the entire file. And that's, what's interesting about that is, is um, great question. When you, when you analyze codecs, you can do it two ways. You can have, like, you can have a five-second talking head file and then analyze that, or you can have like a 90-second file with mixed content, which is you know, probably most of the content out there is, is, uh, is, uh, is mixed, right? Even if it's a talking head, you've got animation up front. Maybe you've got a cut over to B-roll. So it's, but if you, if you encode a single file, there's no averaging of the results. There's no... You know, there's no, well, geez, that was good here, this one was good there, so on average, they're about the same. And what VQMT does is it lets you, it shows you a graph of the comparative um, measures over the file. So you can actually see which regions each, 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 um, each codec did better on. Um, yeah, so my question really was, did you get a sense of how each HAVC and VP9 fluctuated within the longer files? 
you the, just gave a pretty long file. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's 90 seconds, so it's not. Um, I think it was two minutes for the movies and 90 seconds for the. Um, if, if you send me an email, I'm going to be doing a lot of that work this weekend or redoing it, and I'd be glad. I can just send you the graph, and then you can. So the graph, um, I guess it's low risk now to switch, but if I can figure out how to do it. Okay, I can't find it here, but I can, I can show you the graph. It's, it's, uh, and also, if you want to really get into it, you get the numbers as well. So you get a per frame comparison. So if you want to focus at that level. Any other questions that you have? Um, I think in this room we've all focused on the streaming media, uh, streaming media but uh, how about the, the Blu-ray USB? Uh, is it could be the potential uh, influencer to the, the codec world in US, UHD space? I'm sorry, UH, um, uh, the, uh, Blu-ray USB. Uh, oh, Blu-ray. I don't know anything about that. I mean, I know it's kind of coming. I, I guess I assumed that was HEVC, but yeah. um, but does that, are you thinking it's still kind of up for grabs and it might be VP9 as well? Uh, I just want to know uh, from your, uh, your viewpoint, uh, if this would be an uh, influencer to uh, the UHD codec uh, uh, between the HEVC and uh, VP9? Um, I, th I think, you know, what, w one of the interesting things that I, we talk about um, what's it cost to, to encode an hour of video. Use, so assume you have to encode an hour of video and it's, you're encoding nine streams for adaptive streaming. How much does that cost? Let me hear, let me hear some estimates. Anybody? Who thinks more than $100? Who thinks more than $50? Who wants me to shut up so you can get out of here? Um, the cost to encode an hour-long video is, is 20, $24. And that's some math I put together looking at cloud encoding for. So really, I think it's, it's relevant, but it's not dispositive. Because I think, you know, I looked at the same argument with, H, with HDR. And I think if you, if you look at Netflix having to re-encode their entire um, library of 8,000 movies, it's going to cost them $300,000. So, they're not going to, that's not going to swing a technology decision. So I think if you have to encode multiple times, if you're a high volume producer, it's not that significant. Um, I think it's, it's relevant, but it's not going to, it's not going to be a deciding factor. I'm sorry, can you speak up please? I don't think so because because that's not how it worked with Flash. You know, with Flash, once it was in the player, everybody could use it. Um, so you didn't have to. You know, Adobe paid the, the the five million dollars to include it in Flash, and then they were done. So everybody could access that player. There might be a with it with H.264. There was the potential for royalty for subscription and and uh, pay per view content, but barring that. <coughs> I totally agree, but you know the thing is, what happened with with H.264 was that it was a five million dollar decision for Adobe, and they made it. And you know when they made that in '06, whatever year it was, I mean there was no mobile, there was no OTT, it was all browser based, and they changed the world in one five million dollar decision. Um, that doesn't exist anymore. Number one, it's there's 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 no player who can do that because it's all browser based, and number two. We just play video in so many more places. So I don't know why Chrome, you know, again, $25 million for, uh, for, for, for 
Google or for Apple or for Microsoft is, is small change, but they haven't, they haven't done it. You know, Adobe is never going to do it because $25 million for them is, you know, I looked a few quarters ago and their, their net for the quarter was 50 million. So you can imagine the conversation between the product manager and the CFO. It's like, yeah, we'd like to license ATBC and, and cut your earnings by 50%. I mean, that's not going to happen, but, but Google and, and, uh, and Apple, it really could. But it hasn't. That's the point. It hasn't. Any other questions? Okay, thanks for your attention.